Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Essential Guides to Audio Processing in Cubase 12. Having a look at event-based gain management today. So this is the concept of dealing with volume, but on an event-by-event -event basis. The difference between this and automation handling of volume is that automation is really for mixing different um, audio signals together to produce a pleasing melodic output. You know, when you're mixing a song, you blend the bass and the guitar and whatnot together to make an effect that's, that's very nice to listen to. But we use event-based gain management to handle the technical intricacies of plugging different pieces of audio together. If you've got two audio wave files sat next to each other and you don't manage the, uh, the translation from one event into the next, you could end up with an audio click as some sort of audible pop as the, the, the audio signal dramatically quickly goes from one place to another. That's gonna manifest as some sort of artifact in the sound. That's a technical issue. It's got nothing to do with mixing. And one of the easiest and simplest uh, means of demonstrating this is at the beginning and end of every event in your song, as a general matter of course, you're going to want to have some sort of fade in. See, the beginning of each one of these events is basically a hard chop. That means at this moment in time, if there's any audio going on, that audio might instantaneously appear and that could be a problem. So generally speaking, what you'll tend to find people do is apply very small fades to the beginning of each audio. By dragging this fade marker out on the audio, you can see um, it's basically gradually fading in and out. Now this is a real time process. So once you've got all this stuff done, it's typically then a common process to bounce all of this down to a, to a final unprocessed form. We take all of this real-time processing out of the equation and we bake it into the audio itself. But today we're just having a look at the means of actually manipulating this stuff. You can select multiple events simultaneously and fade them both in at the same time. If these fades are offset in any way, I'm just going to pick one of these events up and move the start point. Watch the fade move with it. Now if I pick both of those events up again and start performing a relative fade, each of those fades is going to move by the same amount, but from a different start point. So when you select multiple different events, just bear in mind that they're all going to move relative to each other. Put this one back and you'll see the fade move along with it. And this could be a great technique if you've got like eight tracks of harmony, all of which start singing more or less at the same time. Well, this is a good example, actually, because th these three guitar parts are performing a relatively similar job. So I'll just take the two fades off that I previously applied. And now I can pick them all up and apply a tiny little bit of fade in at the beginning of each one of them. And now none of them are gonna pop. Now I like to see this fade information permanently. And if we head up into edit preferences in our uh, event display audio, we've got this show event volume curves always. If I turn that off and say apply, then those event curves just disappeared. Only the highlighted, the selected track uh, will have its event displayed, uh, the, uh, the fade information displayed. So let's turn that back on. And as I said at the start of this episode, all of these fades are event based. So I'm gonna make this event nice and big. And then I'm gonna get my scissors out and I'm gonna cut the event in the middle of this fade. Watch what happens. So it's basically abandoned everything after that point. There is no fade anymore and it's increased the, the, the fade on the, on the remaining part of the event to the maximum. It's basically done as good a job as it could possibly do. We have to get to the point by the end of this fade, by the end of this event, where we're up to maximum. There's no concept of being able to fade to anything other than the limit. You see, I'm dragging, I'm trying to drag up and down here, but it, there's, there's no option to. This is a fade in, end of chat. Obviously, at the end of the event, we have a fade out but never the twain shall meet. You can't take a fade out beyond the beginning and vice versa. And you can see what it's doing with that fade in as I, as I move it. All pretty intuitive stuff. Now have a look at the mess that we've left with the fade ins on each of these three events. Let's say I wanna get back to the situation where they're all doing a consistent thing. They've all got this very small fade in. It's a little bit difficult as things stand because basically I'd have to pick each one up individually. But if I switch to my range tool, 
and I'm going to turn grid off to give myself fine control here. And I'm just going to pick a range that represents just the beginning of the event. Now, if we head up into audio, fades, you've got these fade options that deal with ranges. So if I say adjust fades to range, now it's reset all of the fade ins to cover that part of the range. That's a nice, simple fix. I'm just going to deselect that information and I'll just select uh, the bottom of the three tracks. I'm going to head back into the audio menu and this time in my fades uh, menu, I'm going to say open fade editor. And this is going to give me a box that allows me to edit the fades on any selected events. So the single event that I selected only has a fade in. And so you can see that this box is called fade in. The reason why I specifically chose uh, the lowest of the three events is because if I choose this event, a slightly confusing thing happens. I'm going to go back in to the fade editor again. And this time it says fade out. Well, what happens if I want to process the fade in? Um, it's very unintuitive, but there are actually two windows here. Move one of them out of the way and there's a fade in window underneath. So, um, <laughs> Why they've been represented as two separate windows, I don't know. But you've basically got the options to manipulate both the fade in and the fade out if they exist on any given event. Um, if neither, if the event didn't have a fade in or a fade out, and we try to select that option, it's going to tell us we can't. It needs to be some existing fade information before we can actually get into this box at all. Once we're in here, we've got some pretty fancy options available to us. We can have curved fades. So you can see that it's setting, this is a linear, you see it's stepping up um, in straight lines because at the moment uh, I'm in linear interpolation mode. If I switch to damped spline or spline, this is basically um, whether or not your, your curves are gonna revolve around the points or the bits in between the points. So if I set to damped spline, you can see now I've got quite a smooth curve. That's the one that I would use if I was editing curves. A regular spline is a bit crazy and <laughs> tends to do this kind of stuff. And switch back to linear. And now if I say apply, watch this fade. It's now applied this curve to the event fade. If I want to abandon that, I can press the restore button, then I click apply, and we're back to square one. Now fade ins and fade outs are great if you're dealing with isolated events, but for events that join or overlap other events, that's not gonna be enough on, on its own. You're going to need to cross fade, which means simultaneously reducing the level of um, event number one, whilst increasing the event number two in order to get a smooth transition between those two. So let's have a look at uh, cross-fading. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set myself up an example. For this example, I'm going to use the middle of these three tracks, 2NC2. So I'll mute the other one. I've got a MIDI track at the bottom of the project that I want to get rid of. That's from our previous episode. And I'm just going to get rid of all this fade information that I set up on the event and glue those two things back together again. So we're basically back to one continuous event. Okay, here's what I'm gonna to do to demonstrate cross-fading. First thing that I'm gonna do is chop this event into four bars. So each one of these bars is now a separate event, but obviously the underlying audio is still exactly the same as it was. If I zoom in really tight around bar six, you can see everything completely natural because this is the, the live performance that was recorded. What I'm going to do is turn grid off and choose my range tool. And I'm going to get set up so that I've got one beat before the bar and one beat after the bar. Okay. So I can now cycle around this bar. These two beats. I'm going to focus in on this transition at bar six. I'm gonna select a little bit of the audio using my range tool, and I'm gonna press X, which is gonna apply a crossfade. Now, can you see the underlying audio behind is exactly the same as it was before I started. I'll just undo that process. There's absolutely no change whatsoever, because what's happening is that 
basically a copy of the, the audio that was already there is being reintroduced. There's nothing else to be done. If, however, I delete bar six and I pick this equivalent bar up, oops, I'm not in grid mode, just snap this to the grid. Now it's musically the same, playing the same notes, but if I zoom in really tight now, see it looks pretty good. Can you also see there's a tiny little bit of hash here? That's because we're on snap to zero crossing. So it's picked this event up when I've said cut, basically behind the scenes, Cubase is compensating to make sure everything's always at a zero crossing. I'll show you what I mean, I'll pull one of these events back. You can see that this event underneath is slightly overlapping because this is where the zero point crosses. Now, as you can see, I've got the same range selected. Every time I reintroduce the range tool, the previous range is going to come back. When I press X this time, watch very carefully. The audio information behind the scenes has changed. I'll undo and redo and undo. You can see those two signals merging together. That's as this event is basically faded out gently and the underlying audio from the second event is being overlaid on the top of it and gradually faded in. This is critically important to understand when you're dealing with crossfades. You need to have some audio data there in your event. If these two audio events had been bounced so that event number one had an absolute cutoff at bar six and event number two started at exactly bar six. There's no opportunity to crossfade because you've got none of that underlying audio. This is why you always wanna be really careful about bouncing because it prevents the opportunity to do these crossfades. Now that I've got the crossfade, I just came out of the range selection tool mode. So I'm back in my standard selection tool. And when I hover over the beginning or end of the crossfade, you can see that I have the opportunity to manipulate it this, in my opinion, is by far the best way to manipulate crossfades because you can see visually how those two events merge together. Generally speaking, in my opinion, the best way to approach crossfading is to do as little as possible. Have your crossfade over the smallest possible amount of space, unless you're using it for a musical purpose, unless you're genuinely merging two songs together and you want to have a sense of kind of dynamic tension, that's fine. What I'm talking about here is fixing technical issues and you can do it both visually, just by looking at the wave and thinking that lacks, that looks absolutely fine, but obviously you're gonna need your ears to help you as well. transition between those two notes sounds absolutely fine. It's completely smooth. And what's actually going on behind the scenes when we manipulate these crossfade points is that the events themselves are being elongated. If I open the lanes view and switch to grid relative, just pick one of these things up. That's how the crossfade's being generated. The two events are being extended or truncated such that one of them can be faded out and one of them can be faded in. It's no more complex than that. If we change our mind and we don't want this crossfade, uh, we can get rid of it. You head into audio, fades. You've got crossfade at the top, which is X, as I said earlier, but right down at the bottom, we've got remove fades, which is shift X. I've got this set up on a keyboard shortcut. So I'll select basically either of these events will do. So you uh, press Shift X and it takes it away. Just undo that process, select the other event, and again, the crossfade's gone. Let's bring it back, press X. Now I'll just close the lanes view down to make it a little bit less visually confusing, and I'm gonna double click the crossfade. That brings up our crossfade editor. Now, this is a new introduction. I think Cubase 12 introduced this new crossfade editor. It is hugely overblown. There's stuff in here that I have just no interest in at all. What I'm actually gonna do for the purpose of the rest of this demonstration is get back to the simple crossfade editor that I used to really like. In editing audio, you can engage the old world Luddite simple crossfade editor. I'm gonna say yes and double click again. And now we get a much simpler view. The stuff in this window, in my opinion, 
is really useful. We'll have a quick look at the complex one again a little bit later. As you can see, we can apply curved crossfades in just the same way that we could um, to the fade-ins and the fade-outs earlier. And you can see that they're currently mirrored. The reason that they're mirrored is this equal gain option. If I turn equal gain off, now I've got independent control of both the fade in and the fade out components of the crossfade. So both of these things are being summed together and you're, you're seeing the visual representation of these two edits. Again, we've got lots of defaults to choose from. We turn equal gain back on, then we can simplify everything back to our standard linear crossfade. 99% of the time linear crossfade is gonna be absolutely fine for you. By manipulating this length value over here, we basically get to dynamically shrink and expand the box. And that's pretty much all I'm interested in. If you want to hear kind of an audition of just the crossfade with no audio processing on it at all, you've got a tiny little audition tool at the bottom. So if I say play crossfade, what you heard there was two seconds before the crossfade, then the thing itself, then two seconds of post crossfade. That's what the pre-roll and the post roll do. So that's a really nice little feature set and super useful in the full blown crossfade editor. Let's pull it back up again. We have a much more complex editor and you need to be careful with this thing because by default, it will let you pick up the audio. Let's just move this thing out of the way and actually move the waves themselves. So you just need to be careful to ensure that you're actually performing crossfade operations and you're not moving the underlying audio. We've also got the opportunity to nudge, just basically jump forwards or backwards in fixed quantized amounts. So if I say uh, move the fade by, by 30 seconds and press these little arrows, then you can see the crossfade jumping forwards and backwards appropriately. I mean, feel free. I think it's fine. It's a little bit overcomplicated for my liking, but you know, each to their own. Now it's not just the beginnings and ends of events that we can manipulate with our fades. We've also got fully fledged um, gain controller inside the event itself. If I right click and select the pencil tool, you'll see the pencil with a little sine wave, wavy line. I can now draw, if I click the pencil, I'm now drawing on the curve and you can see the volume corresponding. If I go back to any of these white points and anywhere in the vicinity, click again, I'm gonna pick the node up and move it. If I'm slightly inaccurate, I'm gonna accidentally create myself a new volume node. So it's a little bit clunky because it's so fine grained, but you can actually set up gain curves with this tool. Now the reason why I don't like doing this for the most part is that this is straying too far into the automation slash mixing territory. A possible use case for something like this is if there's like a, a crackle or a pop, some sort of audio event that you just want to kind of surgically excise, you can do it with volume control like this. And if none of the rest of these events were here, you could basically kind of just take out a very small space of the audio permanently. So it's got nothing to do with automation. Automation is an extra layer that's gonna be added onto this stuff. But you know, that's a potential option. If you decide you've made a complete mess of all of these um, edit, edit points, they're a little bit tricky to actually get rid of. You can't delete them, that deletes the track. You can't select them, that selects the, the event. So basically your only option uh, is to head into your audio, menu and say remove volume curve and that will throw it all away. Finally and very quickly one feature that I'm not going to go into in great detail because I don't use it at all in the project menu you've got auto fade settings you can set standard default um, settings that will be applied across the entire project so if I engage uh, auto fade in for instance and set the length at 10 millisecond every event in the project will have a 10 millisecond fade in that's a lot of processing overhead where not a lot of it's gonna be necessary. I like to maintain complete manual control. 
um, over my fades. The main reason I don't particularly like auto fades, and I'm not going to actually show you a demonstration of them today, is because they're not visually represented in the project. So it's super easy to lose track of what you've done. So I much prefer to maintain manual control, but if you want to check out those auto fade options, then, you know, be my guest. Okay, that'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.